lecture recital, Marshkovsky, Camiso, and Trainin. Thank you for being here tonight. The first time I heard Marshkovsky's name was in my piano literature class in the spring of 2008. We were covering his etudes, which are often used as encores for their sparkling brilliance. I thought they were pretty cool, so I checked into the rest of his compositions. That's when I came across his piano concerto in E major. I immediately fell in love, and I was hopelessly infatuated with this concerto. But knowing it was something I'd likely never play, I set it aside and went on with my life. <laughs> it wasn't until I started considering rep for my lecture recital that I again began pouring through his catalog of works. When I, st when I stumbled across his song cycle, it took some research to track down a copy through interlibrary loan. And waiting for it to arrive, I didn't realize what a gem I had discovered. On August 23, 1854, Moritz Mushkowski was born into a wealthy Polish Jewish family. He was born in Breslau, Prussia, which is now Wrocław, Poland, to a Polish father and a German mother. His arrival, was out with, uh, his arrival was without great pomp and circumstance. In a tongue-in-cheek autobiographical letter, Mashkovsky wrote, I took my first step before the public in my earliest youth following my birth, which occurred August 23, 1854 in Breslau. I selected this warm month for the event in hopes of a tornado, which always plays so prominent a part in the biography of great men. This desired tempest, in consequence of fav favorable weather, did not occur, while it accompanied the birth of hundreds of men of much less importance. Embittered by this injustice, I determined to avenge myself on the world by playing the piano. He began his musical studies at home until his family moved to Dresden in 1865, upon which Mortz began studying at the conservatory conservatory there at the age of 11. In 1869, when he was 15, he moved to Berlin to study at the Stern Conservatory. Mashkovsky studied piano with Eduard Frank and composition with Friedrich Kiel. His next stop was Kulak's Neue Akademie der Tonkunst, where he studied orchestration with Heinrich Dorn and composition with Richard Wurst. Wurst had studied with Mendelssohn, and this likely was an important connection for Mashkovsky, who shared Mendelssohn's Jewish heritage. At 17, in 1871, Kulak offered Mashkovsky a teaching position at the academy. He accepted and began a successful teaching career while also serving as a violinist in the orchestra there. Two years later, at 19, he made his first successful appearance as a pianist and began a touring career. Within another two years, he had already written and performed a two-piano version of his piano concerto with Franz Liszt for a select audience Liszt invited. Mashkovsky took the education of his students very seriously, devoting both time and money for aspiring young artists. We'll take a brief look at a few of his more well-known students. Frank Damrosch shared a birth city with Mashkovsky, and after studying with Mashkovsky, Damrosch went on to work in the music education system in the United States. He eventually founded the New York Institute of Musical Art, which later merged with the Juilliard Graduate School to form the modern school we know as Juilliard School. Mashkovsky also taught two important Spanish composer pianists, Joaquin Nin from Havana, Cuba, and Joaquin Turina of Spain. In 1884, at the age of 30, Mashkovsky married Henriette Chaminade, who was the younger sister of the pianist-composer Cécile Chaminade. With Henriette, Mashkovsky had two children, a son, Marcel, and a daughter, Sylvia. There are a few things about Mashkovsky that strangely parallel Schumann's life. Uh, it is one thing that Mashkovsky fits squarely into the Schumann school, but it is a strange coincidence that, reportedly due to over-practicing as much as 10 hours per day at the age of 31, Mashkovsky developed a disorder that rendered him unable to perform in public due to the strain on his arms. Like Schumann, he turned his creative energy to composing, in addition to teaching and conducting. Some things continue to go well, though. Mashkovsky was composing popular salon pieces while also championing larger works. 
1887, he was invited to London to introduce his orchestral pieces, and he was designated an honorary member of the Royal Philharmonic Society. But shortly thereafter, things began to slowly turn sour. At the age of 36, he is left by his wife, who has fallen in love with the poet Ludwig Fulda. The divorce is issued two years later. At the age of 43, he moves to Paris, still wealthy and quite famous, with his second wife and daughter. There, he taught Josef Hoffmann and Sir Thomas Beecham, among others. Mashkovsky was known for investing lots of money and time into young, passionate artists. At this time, he was also offered large um, sums of money to come to the United States to show off American piano brands. He never accepted any of these offers. Mashkovsky was always proud of his Jewish heritage. Uh, take a look at these two quotations that were inscribed in the same book. They look very similar, but Mashkovsky pays homage to Jewish composers in his. In the first, composer pianist Hans von Berlo writes, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. All the others are cretins or idiots. And beneath those words, Mashkovsky wrote, Mendelssohn, Meyerbeer, and Mashkovsky. All the others are Christians. <laughs> I'd also like for us to take a look at one of Mashkovsky's enduring and unmistakable accomplishments. <laughs> that is an incredible mustache that he obviously started growing when he was born. <laughs> Sadly, the rest of the program kind of falls downhill from here. In uh, 1908, Mashkovsky starts refusing students because, quote, they wanted to write like artistic madmen, such as Scriabin, Schoenberg, W.C., and Seti. Becoming a recluse and his health failing, he sold all of his copyrights and invested every penny in German, Polish, and Russian bonds and securities. All of these were rendered worthless at the outbreak of World War I. His health in steady decline and buried in debt, Marshkovsky's former students organized a benefit concert for him at Carnegie Hall. Several of the top pianists in the world performed. There were 14 pianos on the stage, and at one point they were all being played. The concert was a success, and they raised over $10,000. Sadly, the money never made it to Marshkovsky. He died of stomach cancer on March 4th, 1925 in Paris. Musically, Mashkovsky falls in the line of Mendelssohn and Schumann, with the majority of his work telling short stories. Uh, he also shares many similarities with another Polish composer, Chopin. Uh, likely the most played of his output, Mashkovsky wrote three sets of Spanish dances for four hands at the piano. These incredibly popular pieces are credited with his initial rise to fame. Also widely performed is his vast piano music. Paderewski said, after Chopin, Mashkovsky best understands how to write for the piano. Moving to some of his larger works, I want to again draw your attention to his piano concerto in E major. This concerto has experienced somewhat of a revival after years of his music being forgotten. He had written another piano concerto earlier in his career, but destroyed it. A humorously self-effacing man, Mashkovsky wrote to a friend about the concerto that survived, quote, I should be happy to send you my piano concerto, but for two reasons. First, it is worthless. Second, it is most convenient, the score being 400 pages long, for making my piano stool higher when I am engaged in studying better works. <laughs> Mashkovsky wrote one opera, Moabil, Der Letzte Mountainkönig, uh, which is uh, Moabil, The Last Moorish King, which is about the capture of Granada. The opera was premiered at the Berlin Court Opera and was shortly thereafter performed in Prague and New York, but never made it into the standard rep. Other works include another piano duet from Foreign Lands, which he transcribed for orchestra. It takes the listener on a tour of Russia, Italy, Germany, Spain, Poland, and Hungary. In terms of chamber music, he has little output, and the most commonly performed is a showpiece for two violins and piano. And he also wrote a violin concerto in C major. Trainin is one of only four sets of songs. It is the largest, 
the others being just two or three in an opus. This one has five songs. Um, and one of the other opuses is a setting of three folk songs. I don't plan to delve too deeply into Camiso's life. I just want to scratch the surface, surface about a few things. Born in 1781 uh, in France, his family was exiled, exiled after the French Revolution. Relocating to Berlin, he began a career in the Prussian military. During his time in the military, he spent three years studying the natural sciences. At the same time, in 1803, he founded a Muses Almanac, in Berlin with his friend. Interrupted by war and his responsibilities as he was still enlisted, the publication eventually failed. But Camiso's contributions to this almanac brought him to the attention of literary celebrities of the day. After being discharged, he pursued botany, first in Switzerland, and then aboard a Russian ship upon which he explored the Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea. He eventually returned to Berlin where he died in 1838 at the age of 57. We are most familiar with Camiso for writing the poetry found in another song cycle, Schumann's incredibly popular Frauen Liebe und Leben. It is interesting that Majkowski, who bore other similarities to Schumann, chose to set the life story of a woman like Schumann did, using, this, uh, using poetry by the same poet. One other important connection Camiso has to the musical world is his prose narrative, Peter Schlemo. In this novella, Peter sells his shadow to the devil in exchange for a bottomless wallet of gold. Finding that the woman he loves, and society in general, is wary of a man without a shadow, Peter suffers the guilt of his decision. The devil offers to give Peter's shadow back in exchange for his soul, but Pedro refuses and throws away the wallet, too. He eventually finds self-contentment self while communing with nature. This is not surprising, considering the man who wrote about this was a botanist. I bring this up because uh, Peter Schlimmel is featured in the third act of Offenbach's opera, Tales of Hoffman. We'll turn now to the cycle Brennan and I will be performing for you this evening. And I'll begin with by giving a brief overview of the, uh, of the cycle. <laughs> so, th there's a map because it's slightly complicated. Brennan sings the role of this girl. Um, and then you'll find out here in a second who everybody else is. Um, training is a set of five, uh, Trainin, the poems, is a set of seven poems, five of which Mashkovsky set. Kamiso's poems tell the story of a young woman who we imagine to be roughly 15 or 16 years old. She is, of course, madly in love with this man, but her father is making her marry another man. Her father wants her to marry this guy, and that's the priest who is featured in the song cycle. Complicating matters, her mother, who presumably would have been the voice of reason to the girl's father, has died. Now, be warned, <laughs> I'm about to give away the whole plot. So if you prefer to be surprised, just close your ears for the next 15 or so minutes. <laughs> In the first poem, the girl is addressing her father, whom she blames for breaking her heart. She tells him that she has obeyed and renounced the man she loves, but she will never forget him. She claims her love for the man will live on in her even if she dies. She goes on to ask only one thing of her father, and this will remain her one wish throughout the cycle. She asks that when she dies, that she be buried by the church wall near the elder bush alongside her mother. While early on in the cycle, it may seem to simply be a way to manipulate her father by bringing up an emotional reference to his dead wife, but we'll see later that she has specific reasons for this request. In the second poem, our, our heroine hangs on to hope that the man she loves will come to her rescue before she is forced to wed the other man that night. On this last day of hope, she watches out her window from before dawn until nightfall. 
In the pre-dawn haze, she peers out her window for her rescuer. By midday, briefly giving up hope, she weeps bitterly, but pulls herself together, believing more than ever that he will come. As night falls, the wedding approaches, and she abandons all hope. I believe the third poem happens almost immediately after the second. With her impending marriage at hand, she rushes to her mother's grave before the, uh, before the ceremony starts. In this poem, Camiso shows us how in shambles the girl's life is. The poem begins as she tells her mother that it is not the dew or rain that's penetrating to her grave, but rather her tears burning into the ground. The girl digs desperately to her mother, her hands torn and her nails spurting blood as she throws clods of dirt and tears into the casket. After reaching her mother's body, the girl takes off the ring the man she loves gave her and leaves it with her mother. She asks her mother to preserve the ring for her, which is one reason she asks to be married, but to be buried by her mother, to be reunited with that ring in death. Before going, she specifically addresses the ring, lamenting that they are being parted and promising that they will be reunited in the earth. The man the girl loves finally shows up by the fourth poem. The girl encourages him to remember when she promised herself to him, but then tells him that he needs to seek out another love. She describes how a man came and bartered with her father. They struck a deal, and this other man gets the fields, the house, the girl's mother's inheritance, and the hand of the girl in marriage. She then describes what transpired next to the man she loves. She tells him of the marriage ceremony, how the priest spoke the blessing, and she was wedded by law, but it was a covenant not sealed in heaven. Since he had arrived too late, she tells him to search out another love. Moshkovsky then sets the seventh poem as the fifth and final in this cycle. In it, our protagonist is on her deathbed, speaking to the man to whom she is legally bound. She asks how she has become so pale and asks what more he wants to ask of her. She tells him that she is happy for him. He'd gotten everything he wanted, the house, the fields, and the garden. She asks only one thing of him, the same thing she asked of her father at the beginning. Um, to be buried by the church wall at the elder bush next to her mother. We already know that it is here that she will be rejoined with the ring from her beloved, but I think it's interesting that Camiso chose an elder bush to be this girl's final resting place. As a botanist, he surely purposefully <coughs> chose this particular plant. There are a there's a wide variety of symbolism associated with the elder bush, but the one I found most appropriate to the young girl in the cycle is that the elder bush symbolizes death and regeneration. It is in her death that the girl finds new life, one in which she is free to love the one she cheats. She goes on to describe the place, a small plot, only a few feet wide and long and deep, a place where she will rest shortly and where she will have peace. I won't leave you hanging about the two poems Majkowski did not set. The poems take place after she is married and, um, and has parted with the man she loves, but before her death. So I'll read the two poems now. She, from whose womb a child is born, lost amid bliss and happiness, holding her child in her arms, she gives you praise and honor and weeps tears of thankfulness to you, father of the whole world. And she to whose body you have denied this blessing weeps and grieves and pines. She raises her arms to you and begs, ah, have mercy, have mercy on me. I, the most wretched of all, fallen into disgrace and humiliation and miserable beyond measure, I pray, Woe is me, either out of sympathy or vengeance, make my womb barren. And the sixth poem. I thought I saw him in my sleep. From dread my hair still stands on end. Oh, if only I had cried sleeplessly through the night, as on many a previous night. 
I saw him troubled, worried and pale, as he appeared to write in the sand. He wrote our names. I knew it straightway, and I cried out loudly. He stared, horrified by my cry, and looked at me, silent as the grave. I held my arms out to him, and he, he turned away. Um, we'll turn now to a quick overview of Moshkovsky's settings of the five songs. Without going into tedious theoretical analysis, here is a brief overview of the key scheme of the cycle. The first song, When the Girl is Fighting with Her Father, opens in B minor. There are some short deviations, including the saddest C major chord I have ever heard, but the song finishes in B minor. The second song begins in the relative major, D major, as she awaits her rescue. As she gives up hope when night falls, the key moves not so subtly to the parallel minor of D minor. As she is again wrapped up in fury and despair, the third song is back in B minor as she buries her ring with her mother. The fourth song, when her love finally arrives, is in ABA form. The A sections, when she's talking to her love, are in B major. When she is describing the bargaining and the wedding ceremony in the B section, Majkowski again moves to the parallel minor. The final song begins in E minor, but morphs into E major as she finally finds peace and rest. Just as girls today experience wild mood swings, our protagonist experiences the most violent of emotions. In the moments of her angst, Moshkovsky sets the text against 16th notes. This is true of the fight with her father in the first song, which I will now demonstrate. deal with her father. It is underpinned with chords that um, have suspensions from one beat to the next, but the angst in the running notes is on the top of the figure. song, Triplets Propel Her Forward. And there are two very clear instances of musical repetition by Majkowski. In the first, a progression of block chords accompanies the text he lives in me, though I am dead, in the first song. Later in the same song, the same chords accompany her as she describes her final resting place. song that the chords return, this time without any text. multiple times is melodic rather than a progression of chords. Uh, Brennan refers to this music as the music of the girl's love and the fate of her love. 
the tune happens three times, although the first time we hear it, it isn't a, an exact quote. Um, the first time we hear it is in the third song when she asks her mother to keep the ring for her. By the time we hear it is in the fourth song as she pleads with her love to find another. Majkowski's use of the 4-1 progression, brilliant, lies in the meaning of Amen. The word Amen means, so be it. And the way Majkowski uses it signals both the girl's acceptance of the events that are out of control, but at the same time, paint the pain that she's experiencing. Uh, the first use of the Amen is rather conventional. In the fourth song, Amens punctuate the priest's prayer. but the four chords are borrowed from the minor key. Uh, this paints both the finality of what's happening, the so be it, but gives us the twinge of pain that the girl is experiencing. It is as if her subtext is, this is the way it's going to be, but it's still killing me. The first example of this use is at the end of the fourth song, after she has pleaded for her love to find another. <laughs> peace in the E major, it's not how she wanted things to unfold. depressing, but I hope you'll find the tragic beauty in this piece that Brendan and I have come to love. <laughs> 